Um, let's do some real analysis. The um, I didn't mean for that to sound cute. Um, <laughs> this is what we ended up saying last time, and I want to talk uh, about this in a bit of detail. This is a fact which, properly understood, I hope seems like an obvious fact, although it, it, I mean, it looks kind of like nonsense when you write it this way, but it says uh, x equals zero, if and only if, so what I wrote over here is supposed to be equivalent to x equals zero, and what I wrote over here, I hope you're familiar with this, this little symbol here means for all. You will look cool in front of your friends if you use that symbol. Um, for all epsilon greater than zero, the absolute value of x is less than epsilon. The only way that this can actually be true, this statement, is when x is zero. And the other way around is true. If x is zero, then this uh, statement is true. Remember, what, what you should, how you should interpret this is, I say for all epsilon greater than zero, that means epsilon can be any number, although you should probably think of epsilon being a really small number because otherwise this is not an interesting thing to say. What I'm saying over here is that the absolute value of x is smaller than epsilon no matter what epsilon is. So no matter how small epsilon is, x is even smaller in the absolute value, all right? The only way that's true, so my like very informal interpretation of all of this Basically, what I'm saying is absolute value of x is smaller than anything, right? No matter what epsilon is, as long as epsilon is a positive number, we're saying that the absolute value of x is less than that. Whatever you can think of, it's less than that. And the only way that could be true is if x is actually 0. That's, all, that's what the theorem is saying. x is 0 is the same as saying this kind of complicated thing over here. x is smaller than any possible thing, all right? This is a very roundabout way of saying that x is zero. Um, why would you want to say anything in such a roundabout way? It turns out that this style of saying things is actually like how we're going to say everything in this course. Because like I said last time, this course uh, in large part is about making technically correct ways of expressing ideas about when things are really, really small or getting really close together or something like that. Those things you cannot say in ordinary mathematical language. If you just say something is really small, that, that's, not a, that's not mathematically meaningful to say it that way. Instead, you've got to say it this way, something like this. So this is a very simple example. Using this epsilon um, to uh, say x is really, really small, smaller than anything, all right? And as I said last time, the beauty of this approach is you don't actually have to say that epsilon is small, even though you imagine that epsilon is small when you see this, uh, although it's not actually necessary to say that as part of the formulation there, all right? Anyway, I would like to do the proof of this theorem. It's not all that hard, although, uh, you know, we are gonna be writing proofs in this class, so I thought it might be good to start off with uh, some proofs, all right? Um, let's, so first of all, this is a if and only if, which means there are actually two statements to be proved. You gotta prove the, the first thing implies the second thing, and then also that the second thing implies the first thing. So if I imagine this if and only if is like a double arrow here, I'm gonna prove both parts. I mean, I'm gonna prove each part separately. And I guess I'll do this way first. It doesn't really matter. Usually I'll do the easier way first, so in, in this case I don't think there's really much of an easier way. So in this case, we assume, I always like to write down what I'm assuming exact, exactly, and then what I want to prove. So I assume, in this case, I assume the thing on the left, which is that x is zero. And then what I want to prove is the thing on the right, which is this complicated bunch of nonsense. Um, what it says is for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, absolute value x is less than epsilon. So how to prove this? Um, this is another major thing that we're going to be doing all the time in this class. To prove a thing which begins with for all epsilon greater than zero, the way you begin such a proof is you say, let's imagine some epsilon greater than zero, and then I'm going to prove this. And the, I'm going to use actually the same key phrase all semester long. I'm going to say, let epsilon greater than zero be given. And then we'll show that absolute value x is less than epsilon, all right? 
But this phrase here, let epsilon greater than zero be given, is uh, is sort of like a, uh, you could like put that on a t-shirt or something for this class. We're going to say those words all the time because um, so many of our proofs are, or even just like the little arguing things, not in a formal proof, but so much of what we're gonna do involves statements which begin like that. And so we begin the proof like that. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Um, as my friend Mark Demers likes to say, I don't know if you know Professor Demers. He always his uh, his cute his cute thing about these words is um, you can't bring epsilon to the party unless you introduce them. This this is what he says when he talks about that. Proofs in real analysis uh, very very often begin with this uh, this thing. Okay. Anyway, we need to show that x is less than epsilon, where epsilon is some number greater than zero. Anybody feel like you can show that? Or, or feel like it's obvious given the scenario here? We need to show that x, absolute value of x is less than zero. Yeah? Plugging zero for x. Yeah, right. We have assumed that x equals zero. So in order to show this, we, we can say, I will say, we're going to show that, right? Can I just say? It's enough to show zero less than epsilon, right? That's what she said. Just plug in zero for absolute value x because x equals zero. And uh, how can we show zero is less than epsilon? Well, that, that, that is what we assumed about epsilon, that it is greater than zero. So it's enough to show zero less than epsilon. And this is true since we assumed uh, epsilon greater than zero. What? I wrote it the wrong way. All right, and that's the end of this part of the proof. Once you untangle all the symbolism, there's not really very much to say. What you end up, what you have to prove is basically what you started with anyway. All right, now in my little proof here, uh, you will notice that I wrote a lot of words I don't know if you are, um, I don't know about your disposition when it comes to writing things like this. Uh, I encounter sometimes students who, in a math class, they're like, their moral code is like, I don't write words in a math class. I just write a bunch of nonsensical symbols. Maybe put commas in between, maybe the three dots in a triangle if you're lucky. Um, can I say, you should write words in this class. You don't have to write a lot of words, actually, in my opinion, I wrote a lot of words here. Uh, you probably don't need to use as many words as I used here, but you should use words. It would be great if you used ordinary English punctuation. Like, check out this period right there. You see that? And this comma here? Um, you are writing sentences. Sometimes the verbs are like less than signs or whatever, but um, please write words as part of your proofs. All right, any questions about that anyway? This is half of the proof, all right? Let's do the other way. So the other way means you assume this thing, which is circled, and then you gotta prove x equals zero. Okay, so the other way. I'm gonna assume that that stuff in, the, uh, in there, for all epsilon greater than zero, absolute value x less than epsilon, all right? And then we'll have to show, we'll show, sometimes I write, and maybe I'll do this right now. It's an abbreviation that I often write, WTS means want to show. I want to show, I'm gonna show. If you don't know how to begin your proof, you should probably begin by writing down what you intend to show. And then maybe simplify it if you can. That's what, what we did uh, up here. I write down what I want to show, and then I realize that actually you can just plug in zero there, and everything is obvious. So I want to show uh, x equals zero, right? That's the structure of this part of the proof. I assume the thing up here, which is in the circle, and then I have to show this thing over here, which is x equals zero, all right? We have assumed that Basically, this stuff here, what that means, remember, your intuitive interpretation of this is that x is smaller than every other number, right? 
the absolute value of x at least is smaller than anything you can think of. Uh, I think the most uh, easiest way to do this part of the proof will be a proof by contradiction. So I'm going to say, this is how I like to write a proof by contradiction. You don't have to write, use the same uh, types of language that I do, but I will say, for the sake of a contradiction, and actually I have an abbreviation that I use for that also, F sock. For the sake of a contradiction, assume um, Remember how to do a proof by contradiction. You assume the opposite of what you're trying to prove and then somehow derive a contradiction. So since I want to show that x is 0, I'm going to assume the opposite, which is that x is not 0, right? And then hopefully we will be able to derive a contradiction using that assumption. All right x is not zero and we also have assumed this business here for all epsilon greater than zero absolute value x is less than x now since we assumed a for all maybe i'll put a little a little sidebar strategy here we assumed for all epsilon blah 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 blah, blah. we assumed some stuff the way to use that assumption is usually to choose a specific value for epsilon because our assumption is that you can do this for any number epsilon and I'm going to actually choose a particular value for epsilon and somehow try to get a contradiction. We assume this, so let's try to choose some particular value for epsilon and hopefully derive some kind of contradiction. By particular, maybe I shouldn't use the word particular, I don't mean like three, or not, not like a very specific number, but some, some value for epsilon that, that references something specific in the context that we are talking about here. And you feel like you can choose some value for epsilon, it has to be um, greater than zero. Choose some, some specific weird value for epsilon that makes, makes something strange happen here. Yeah, I guess. Probably somehow related to x, just because that's the only other thing that, that we are working with here. Zero? Uh, you can't let epsilon be zero. Yeah, epsilon has to be greater than zero. How about just x? Um, because our assumption here is that x is not zero, that means we can use x for the epsilon, although actually it's not quite x because the epsilon has to be positive. You have a, a slight variation. Yeah. Negative epsilon. Negative uh, negative x. Yeah, um, it, it could be x or negative x, but you don't know if x is positive or negative. Yeah. yeah, how about absolute value of x? This is a good idea. The absolute value you need just like technically to make it positive because epsilon has to be positive. So I'm going to say let the epsilon be the absolute value of x. All right. And then what happens? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the assumption is that no matter what epsilon is, absolute value x is less than epsilon. You should feel weird about this, but remember we're trying to derive a contradiction anyway, so this is a good thing. If you, if you suspect that this is contradictory, what we're saying, that's what you want in, in the context of this proof. You want a contradiction. Yeah, so if I let epsilon be absolute value x, then, like he said, if you look, look up at this, then absolute value x less than epsilon means absolute value x less than absolute value x and that is a contradiction because that's a less than not a less than or equal to right which is a contradiction exclamation all right and that's it for this direction of the proof this is just a little warm up um, as will happen, I think this will happen many times in this course, the theorem itself may seem simple and obvious when, when put in the right point of view, although the proof might still seem uh, hard to do and not obvious how to write the proof, even though what you're talking about on some level is kind of intuitively clear. All right, any questions about any of that?
I have one little uh, cute little proof for you all to try, although it, it doesn't involve a lot of, um, as much detail as this, but I would like you to try. This is just a little refresh, refresh your, uh, get in the right mindset for writing proofs. Um, I would like to try this. So uh, use the above theorem to prove, this one looks similar, but it's a little, that theorem was all about when x equals zero. Um, here I want to talk about two numbers and when one number equals another. So not necessarily equaling zero, but just when one number equals another. A equal B if and only if for all epsilon greater than zero, absolute value A minus B less than epsilon. So what we're saying here is basically um, the distance from A to B is smaller than anything. If that's true, then A has to equal B. All right, it's a similar idea, only it's not specifically about the number zero, it's about any uh, two different numbers. All right, see if you can somehow, here's my hint. Maybe I'll, I'll say the hint out loud. Uh, first of all, it's a if and only if, so make sure you do two directions of the proof. My hint is, uh, start with, when you're, when you're looking at this part, try and like re, maybe rearrange that so that it says something equals zero. And then you can use the other theorem, which was about when something equals zero, right? The other theorem said x equals zero, but you can use it about anything equaling zero, all right? You guys try it out. What I like to do every so often is I'm gonna walk around the room and see how you're doing. Uh, if you've got questions or whatever, I would be happy to help out. I'm not trying to um, evaluate you or grade you. I'm just trying to be helpful. So I hope that you don't mind me walking around. I will try to stand back a little bit today just because of that Rona, which I, I still feel fine, but my kid has had it for a few days, so.
Maybe I'll write my, you don't have to write the same thing that I write, of course. All right, you want to talk about these? It's fine. I see a lot of people still writing, which is fine. And um, you, if you said something different than I did, then that's totally fine too. I mean, maybe, uh, unless you did it wrong. Um, there are many ways to do it though. Anyway, uh, so what I've written here is just the first half. Um, I'm assuming A equals B, and then I need to show the stuff on the right-hand side. And this was the, uh, the hint that I said. Since A equals B, you can rearrange this to write, to write it this way instead. A minus B equals zero, all right? And then I used the first term that we did. Instead of uh, that first term was you know x equals zero if and only if blah blah blah. So using a minus b as the x in the other theorem, a minus b equals zero means for all epsilon greater than zero, a minus b in absolute values less than epsilon. This is exactly what the other theorem says using a minus b instead of x. All right. But actually, that, that is what I was supposed to show, right? I said I assume A equal B, and I want to show this. And that's exactly what I ended up doing, using the other theorem, all right? I use the other theorem, but instead of X, I use absolute value of A minus B. So that proves the first direction. Sometimes people like to write a little, a little thing, a little box at the end of the proof or something. This is actually only halfway done. Um, I'll put it at the end. So what about the other direction? I'm gonna do the same kind of trick. The other direction, I begin with this weird stuff over there on the right side. So I assume for all epsilon greater than zero, absolute value A minus B less than epsilon. And I wanna show A equal B, all right? But again, I'm gonna use the, older, the other theorem. The other theorem said if this, I'm gonna use the other theorem but backwards, right? The other theorem says if some absolute value is less than epsilon for every epsilon, that means the thing in the absolute value has to be zero. So here, I have this thing in the absolute value is less than epsilon for every epsilon. The other theorem says that thing inside the absolute value must be zero. So I will say since A minus B less than epsilon for all epsilon, the other theorem, means a minus b equals zero, right? Because that's what the other theorem says. It says something being zero is the same as that thing in absolute values less than epsilon for every epsilon. All right, but then of course that means a equals b, right? A minus b equals zero is the same as a equals b. The end. Shun. I like to write shun at the end of my proofs. I have an old, uh, an old analysis book from like 1912 or something, then they write shun at the end of their proofs, and I think it's cute. So I write shun. You can write whatever you want at the end of your proof. All right. Every so often I see somebody who wrote shun on the comprehensive exam, and I, uh, I appreciate that. Won't necessarily get you a better grade. It will put me in a better mood. 
Here's something that, that does not put me in a better mood. I actually, I got a YouTube comment on one of my old videos uh, over the summer, I think. Some, somebody mansplaining to me said, oh, actually, the word shoon was not pronounced shoon. It was always pronounced shown. But it's like the English word, um, you know, our modern word, so. We don't say sew. We actually pronounce it so. This word, shoon, apparently has the same origins as this word or something. And so it was never actually pronounced as shoon, even though they spelled it that way. I don't care. I'm still going to say it. Shoon. All right. Any, uh, any thoughts about this? I hope that this uh, seems understandable to you all. We're going to do, uh, you know, I just wanted to get us used to thinking about doing proofs again. Because it may have been a while. I don't know if you were doing this kind of thing all summer long. Probably not. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on a little. Like this, um, this I've, I've been talking about this particular concept, really not because it's such an important concept, but because it is uh, sort of the prototype of a lot of ideas that we're going to discuss, although as, as far as theorems goes, those theorems are, are fairly obvious. Um, our first major topic, and I said a little bit about this last time, is completeness. Uh, I mentioned this last time that the real numbers, completeness, this is the, I will say, the fundamental property of the set of real numbers. Like if you ask me, what's so special about the real numbers? Um, one thing that's special about them is you can add them and multiply them. But you know there are other kinds of numbers that you can do that with, and other kinds of things which aren't even numbers. Another special thing about the real numbers is that they have an order to them. Although, again, the real numbers are not the only kind of numbers that you can put in order, like the integers or the rationals. The real uh, sort of fundamental property that the real numbers have that these other types of numbers do not have is the completeness property. And it basically means, here's sort of the intuit intuitively, what the completeness property is, is that the set of real numbers has no, I will say, gaps or missing numbers uh, in between other numbers. Unlike, for instance, the, the rational numbers, the rational numbers are sort of distributed throughout the entire number line, but there are some numbers that are not rational, that, that are like, you could think of them as little, little gaps in between those rationals. There are irrationals, right? But the real number line doesn't have any stuff that's missing in between the real numbers. There are no other numbers that, that sort of go in between the real numbers. Um, Another way you could say this, so this is one kind of way of intuitively saying what the completeness property means. Here's another intuitive uh, way of saying it. If um, some real numbers approach something, then that thing that they are approaching is also a real number. It's not something else. Uh, and that thing they approach is also a real number. This also is, uh, is in intuitive and informal, because I'm using the word approach here, which is an informal word. And also, this um, if some real numbers approach something, then that thing that they approach is also a real number. That's not actually true of like infinity, but I would say Real numbers can actually approach infinity in the way that I'm talking about. When I, when I use the word approach, I'm not talking about approaching infinity. Um, even though I know we do use the word approach, I have to be more specific about exactly what this word approach is supposed to mean. But these are both uh, sort of intuitive notions about completeness. For example, um, here is a sequence of numbers which approaches something. Right? These numbers approach, what do they approach? These approach pi. I met a kid at my, uh, a, 
kid at my church this past weekend. Her, she's like a, she's like a fifth grader or something. And her dad was, came over to me, um, and he's like, "Hey, my kid, uh, I'm so proud of my kid. Um, my kid has memorized the first hundred digits of pi." And um, and they're like, "How many do you know, Mr. Math Professor?" And I'm like, uh, "That many. <laughs> it's about <laughs> it's about how many I know. Uh, I don't know a lot of digits of pi." Anyway, those uh, numbers approach pi. What's interesting about this example here is that each of these numbers, um, these are all rational, right? And even if you wrote down more and more, ask that, ask that kid, um, all those numbers that the kid has memorized, they make rational numbers when you just build the number up to a certain point and then you stop. But the thing which they approach is not rational. It's Irrational, right? It's a, it's still a real number, though. So, um, in this way, you can tell that the the set of rational numbers is not complete. That's because you can have a bunch of rational numbers approaching something, but the thing which they're approaching is not also a rational number. It's irrational. So, these things approach pi. Here we have um, rational numbers can approach. And irrational, right? So for this reason, Q, the set of rational numbers, is not complete. Because you can have rationals which approach an irrational. But R does not work like that. Um, R is complete. If you have real numbers that approach something, the thing they approach is automatically a real number. You know, not everything is a real number. There is such a thing as like imaginary numbers, but it is a fact. Real numbers cannot approach an imaginary. They can only approach other real numbers. That's just because they go in a line and they only approach other things on that line. I'm not saying that there is nothing else because there are imaginary or whatever else, but uh, you can't approach them with real numbers. All right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more technically about the completeness property. So actually, we're not going to talk about this approaching for a little while. Uh, completeness is usually the definition we're going to use is, um, is in terms of bounded sets, sets which have a, like a maximum or a minimum size to them. So completeness is defined in terms of bounded sets. I said this is going to be more technical, but actually it's, it's all very simple, um, just terminology that we have to agree upon. Completeness is defined in terms of bounded sets. So let's talk about bounded sets. Here's a definition. A set A, I hope you uh, don't mind my, uh, I use a little set notation here. A is a subset of R. That means it's just a set of some real numbers. A set A in R is called bounded above. This means probably exactly what you think it means. It just means that the set does not like stretch out to infinity uh, in terms of the large elements. It has a certain upper, upper limit to it uh, as in terms of the numbers that are in this set. So a set is bounded above if how can I say that as a definition? This I'm trying to define what I mean by bounded above. Like I just said, it basically it doesn't stretch out to infinity, although I don't want to say that as the definition because that's not very technical language. Um, the way I'm going to say this is there is some number that's bigger than everything in the set. That means it, it has like an upper limit, right? That's what bounded above means. So I'm going to say it this way. There exists some number b in R. I hope you're familiar with this thing. That means there exists such that A is less than or equal to B for all A in A. You look real fancy if you use the, the there exists and the for all in the same sentence. This is what bounded above means. There is some number B. B is for bound. That's the, uh, the upper bound, such that A is less than B for every A in the set A. That means all the numbers in your set are less than this number B, all right? Uh, in that case, such a B is called 
and upper bound. Obviously, all right? An upper bound, I'll say, for A. And in this case, there are many upper bounds. If the set is actually bounded, then there's actually infinitely many different numbers that you could choose to, to represent the upper bound, right? There are many upper bounds. Like if B is an upper bound, then B plus one is also an upper bound, etc. All right? This is what it means for a set to be bounded above. Uh, can I just say bounded below means the same thing, but right here with a greater than sign rather than a lesser than sign. So I'm, I'm going to write it all out, though. Uh, a set right. A subset R is bounded below if there exists some B in R, hmm? where this B is now called the lower bound, such that A is greater than or equal to B for all A and A. All right? And this B is called a lower bound. And just like before, um, if there is a lower bound, then there are automatically infinitely many lower bounds. Because you could always make the number a little bit smaller, and it will still be a lower bound. All right. I hope this is uh, simple enough terminology. Um, the completeness property comes in when we consider um, the smallest of all the upper bounds, or the greatest of all the lower bounds. That is the least upper bound, or the greatest lower bound. Those are what is important about completeness. So here's a definition. And actually, we have fancy words for those two concepts. Um, if A, a subset of R, is bounded, that is, if it does have an upper bound, then the fancy word for this is called the supremum of A is the least upper bound of A. The least upper bound. If a set has an upper bound, then it has, among all of the upper bounds, there's going to be one which is the smallest. And that's called the supremum of A. Usually, I will not say supremum. This is written as soup of A. And we say soup even though you write it sup. Yes? Um, to be considered bounded, does it mean upper and lower, or just uh, when I should have said bounded above here. So usually, if I just say bounded, that means both above and below. Although, in this case, I meant to say bounded above. Thank you for that. I'm going to squeeze it in here. Nope. And I will move the comma. Yeah, it's like nothing like that never happens. If your set is bounded above, the soup of A is the least upper bound. All right, that's called the soup of A. So, for example, um, let's say A is this set, 3, 3.1, 3.14. This is the same thing I was talking about before. Only considered as a set, not as a sequence. All right. You could draw, draw a picture of this set on the real line. You know, here's here's three. I'm talking about three, and then if like if let's say four is all the way over here. I'm talking about three, and then 3.1 I guess would be like around there somewhere. 3.14 would be very slightly greater than that, right? Etc. I'm talking about a bunch of points kind of around there. All right. Is it bounded above? Like, is there some number that's bigger than all the elements of the set? Yes, definitely. Like, 4, for example, is an upper bound for that set. So I will say 4 is an upper bound. So it is bounded above. 
A is bounded above. There's nothing special about four though. Four is actually bigger than it needs to be. Like 3.5 is also an upper bound. Even 3.2 is bigger than everything in that set. Um, what is the least upper bound? Yeah, it would be pi. All of those things there are less than pi, and that's kind of the point of those numbers is that they are, they are uh, getting, getting mighty close to pi, but none of them exceeds pi, and also none of them equals pi because pi is irrational. So A is bounded above, and in this case, I'll say here, the soup of A equals pi, all right? Generally speaking, there's not like a formula that tells you the soup of a set. You just have to figure it out by, by thinking about what the set is. And in this case, you can tell this, the soup of that is pi. All right. Great. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's time to say, this is a big deal, the completeness property of the real numbers, also known as the axiom of completeness, it's called an, um, an axiom because for our purposes in this class, we are not going to try to prove this. We're going to take this as one of the parts of what defines the real numbers. The axiom of completeness, this is a property of the real numbers. It says if A, a subset of R, is non-empty and bounded above then the soup of A exists and the soup of A is a real number. This is how you say formally what I was saying before intuitively as if you have a bunch of numbers and they approach something, then that something is also a real number. What I'm saying is if you have a set which is bounded above, then it does have a soup which you could think of as being the number that this set approaches as you go to the right. It does have a soup, and that soup is also a real number. That's what I meant when I said the thing that it approaches is also a real number, all right? This is called the axiom of completeness. It is a property of the real numbers. And we're not gonna try to prove this like a theorem because we're gonna take this as part of the definition of what the real numbers are. They are Basically, what you get if you have all the all the irrational, or if you start with all the rational numbers, and then you also include all the possible soups that you could get from sets, what you get is the real numbers. All right. Uh, this has all been about upper bounds and the least upper bound. That's what the soup is. We could also talk about lower bounds and the greatest lower bound. That's important too. Uh, and let me just say, that also has a fancy name. Uh, the greatest lower bound it's the opposite of supremum is the infimum infimum which we will write as inf of A the inf is the greatest lower bound of the set all right. So in our remaining eight minutes, I just want to do a bunch of simple examples. I tell you a set, you tell me what's the soup and what's the inf. All right, the soup is the greatest, uh, the soup is the least upper bound, the inf is the greatest lower bound. So let's just do a bunch of examples here. How about if A is this as an interval? This is the interval from zero to five, which does include five and does not include zero. You could draw a picture of this. Sometimes it's helpful to draw a picture. This would be like that, that kind of thing, right? I don't need that bracket there. Are you accustomed to the empty circle and the filled in circle notation? We're not gonna do this all that much in this class, but I hope you know what that means, where, where this is zero here and this is five. What do you think? What is the soup of A and what is the inf of A? Someone shout it out. What's the soup that's the least upper bound? Five. They're saying five, yeah. The soup is basically what's the number kind of the closest number on the right hand side of the set? This is, an, is a, an informal way of thinking about it. 
It's five in this case. And what about the inf? That would be similar, but on the left-hand side, what do you say? Zero, yeah. Anybody worried that zero is not included in the original set? It doesn't matter. The soup or the inf doesn't have to be in the set that you started with. Just like up here, you know, pi was the soup of this set, even though pi was not in the set uh, to begin with. That's fine. Uh, the soup or the inf is not necessarily part of the original set. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. All right, great. That was a simple example. How about something a little more interesting? I'll call next example B. 1 over n, where n is in the natural numbers. By the way, this thing here means the natural numbers, which in some classes starts with 0 and some classes starts with 1. Class many of you had with me last semester, it started with 0. This class it starts with 1. I don't make the rules. It's in the textbooks. It's a lot of a lot of annoyances occur if you start with zero in this in this class. So the natural numbers, as far as our textbook is concerned, is like this. Not starting with zero. If you start the natural numbers with zero, then you can't actually write this because there is no such thing as one over zero. And that's that's annoying. So we start with one in this in the textbook for this class. Anyway, that's the set that I want to talk about. This is a set of real numbers. Um, I want to talk about the soup and the imp, right? It might be helpful, as before, to try and draw like a little picture of this set if you have a hard time thinking about it. Or you could try to write out what the elements are. I mean, instead of writing it that way, you could write it sort of as a list. 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 third, 1 fourth. Etc. That's what this set is, right? Uh, if I were to draw a picture of that, it would be like here's one. If that's zero, then it has one. It also has a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth, etc. Like that. Maybe once you see that all written out, it's a little clearer what the soup and the imp are. What do you think? What's the the soup? That's the um, the one on the right side. Yes, they're showing me the finger, the good finger. Soup uh, is one, and the um, and the inf. Show me the fingers for that. Yeah, zero. Great. Yeah. Like I said before, there's no formula to tell you the soup or the inf. You just have to kind of try your best to visualize the set and then say what it is. How about I just have two more quick examples. How about the set, uh, the interval minus infinity to five. So drawing this would be 5 here and then everything to the left, including 5, I guess. Uh, no, not including 5, because I, not including 5, all right. A, I wrote A both times, sorry. These should have been Bs, you know what I meant. And this should be a C, I guess. What do you say, the soup of C, that's the least upper bound, is five, right? It's sort of, you can think informally, it's the closest number to the set on the right-hand side. Uh, five, great. What about the int? I see people shaking their heads slowly. Uh, there is no int in this example. Remember, the int is the greatest lower bound, but this set actually has no lower bound because it stretches out to the left forever. So this set is not bounded below, and so the, there is no imp. You might, I mean, you, you may be tempted to say maybe it's negative infinity or something like that, but that doesn't count as the imp. Remember, the completeness axiom says that the soup and the imp also has to be a real number, so you can't, you can't put infinity as your answer here. Um, I'm going to say the imp C does not exist. That's because C is not bounded below. So it doesn't have a lower bound, and so it doesn't have a greatest lower bound. Not every set has a supernamp. It has to be bounded in the first place in order to have a, a least upper bound, and it has to be bounded below to have a greatest lower bound. All right? And one final example. 
this one's a little more interesting. Sorry, I meant x over here. The set of all numbers x such that x squared is less than 2. Again, I want to say, what's the soup in the end? x squared is less than 2. Anyone have a suggestion about how, how we could even think about what numbers? I suppose you could try to like guess and check. Like, is 0 part of this set? Yes, it is. It's, this is all numbers where that number squared is less than 2. So 0 is part of this set. 1 is part of the set because 1 squared is less than 2. 1.1 um, is part of this set. 2 is not because 2 squared is 4, which is greater than 2. Um, Oh, it's time to go. Here, oh. Here's how I would visualize this. You could think of like the graph of x squared looks something like this, right? And its, its values go up to 2 at some point. And I'm talking about all the x's, which are less than, it's really like this interval of values here. Those are all the x values where when you look at their squares, they're, they're less than 2, right? Does this help anyone? Can you say, what's the soup of that? It's the square root of 2. Yeah, this value here, the x value, which goes up to 2 there, is root 2. And so that's the soup. The soup of d is root 2. And the inf? Negative root 2, yeah. All right, great. I hope everybody feels good about soups and imps. Uh, I guess I'll see you Friday. Um, we, uh, yeah, we don't have homework due to today. Usually we have homework due on Wednesday. We'll start next week.